Story seven of The House with the Mezzanine and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov, translated by S. S. Kotelyansky, eighteen eighty nineteen fifty five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story seven My Life The Story of a Provincial Part one. The director said to me, I only keep you out of respect for your worthy father, or you would have gone long since. I replied, You flatter me, Your Excellency, but I suppose I am in a position to go. And then I heard him saying, Take the fellow away, he is getting on my nerves. Two days later I was dismissed. Ever since I had been grown up, to the great sorrow of my father, the municipal architect, I had changed my position nine times, going from one department to another, but all the departments were as like each other as drops of water. I had to sit and write, listen to inane and rude remarks, and just wait until I was dismissed. When I told my father, he was sitting back in his chair with his eyes shut. His thin, dry face, with a dove-colored tinge where he shaved, his face was like that of an old Catholic organist, wore an expression of meek submission. Without answering my greeting or opening his eyes, he said, If my dear wife, your mother, were alive, your life would be a constant grief to her. I can see the hand of Providence in her untimely death. Tell me, you unhappy boy, he went on, opening his eyes, what am I to do with you? When I was younger, my relations and friends knew what to do with me. Some advised me to go into the army as a volunteer, others were for pharmacy, others for the telegraph service. But now that I was twenty-four and was going gray at the temples, and had already tried the army and pharmacy and the telegraph service, and every possibility seemed to be exhausted, they gave me no more advice, but only sighed and shook their heads. "'What do you think of yourself?' my father went on. "'At your age other young men have a good social position, and just look at yourself, a lazy lout, a beggar, living on your father.' And as usual, he went on to say that young men were going to the dogs through want of faith, materialism, and conceit, and that amateur theatricals should be prohibited because they seduce young people from religion and their duty. Tomorrow we will go together, and you shall apologize to the director and promise to do your work conscientiously, he concluded. You must not be without a position in society for a single day. "'Please listen to me,' said I firmly, though I did not anticipate gaining anything by speaking. "'What you call a position in society is the privilege of capital and education. But people who are poor and uneducated have to earn their living by hard physical labor, and I see no reason why I should be an exception. "'It is foolish and trivial of you to talk of physical labor,' said my father with some irritation. Do try to understand, you idiot, and get it into your brainless head that in addition to physical strength you have a divine spirit, a sacred fire by which you are distinguished from an ass or a reptile and bringing you nigh to God. This sacred fire has been kept alight for thousands of years by the best of mankind. Your great-grandfather, General Polenyev, fought at Borodino, your grandfather was a poet, an orator, and a marshal of the nobility. Your uncle was an educationalist, and I, your father, am an architect. Have all the Polanyevs kept the sacred fire alight for you to put it out? There must be justice, said I. Millions of people have to do manual labor. Let them. They can do nothing else. Even a fool or a criminal can do manual labor. It is the mark of a slave and a barbarian, whereas the sacred fire is given only to a few. It was useless to go on with the conversation. My father worshipped himself and would not be convinced by anything unless he said it himself. Besides, I knew quite well that the annoyance with which he spoke of unskilled labor 
came not so much from any regard for the sacred fire as from a secret fear that I should become a working man and the talk of the town. But the chief thing was that all my schoolfellows had long ago gone through the university and were making careers for themselves, and the son of the director of the state bank was already a collegiate assessor, while I, an only son, was nothing. It was useless and unpleasant to go on with the conversation, but I still sat there and raised objections in the hope of making myself understood. The problem was simple and clear. How was I to earn my living? But he could not see its simplicity, and kept on talking with sugary rounded phrases about Borodino and the sacred fire and my uncle and the forgotten poet who wrote bad, insincere verses, and he called me a brainless fool. But how I longed to be understood! In spite of everything, I loved my father and my sister, and from boyhood I have had a habit of considering them so strongly rooted that I shall probably never get rid of it. Whether I am right or wrong, I am always afraid of hurting them, and go in terror lest my father's thin neck should go red with anger, and he should have an apoplectic fit. It is shameful and degrading for a man of my age to sit in the stuffy room and compete with a typewriting machine, I said. What has that to do with the sacred fire? Still, it is intellectual work, said my father. But that's enough. Let us drop the conversation, and I warn you that if you refuse to return to your office and indulge your contemptible inclinations, then you will lose my love and your sister's. I shall cut you out of my will. That I swear by God. With perfect sincerity, in order to show the purity of my motives, by which I hope to be guided all through my life, I said, The matter of inheritance does not strike me as important. I renounce any rights I may have. For some unexpected reason, these words greatly offended my father. He went purple in the face. How "'Dare you talk to me like that, you fool!' he cried to me in a thin, shrill voice. "'You scoundrel!' And he struck me quickly and dexterously with a familiar movement, once, twice. "'You forget yourself!' When I was a boy, and my father struck me, I used to stand bolt upright like a soldier and look him straight in the face. And exactly as if I were still a boy, I stood erect and tried to look into his eyes. My father was old and very thin, but his spare muscles must have been as strong as whipcord, for he hit very hard. I returned to the hall, but there he seized his umbrella and struck me several times over the head and shoulders. At that moment my sister opened the drawing-room door to see what the noise was, but immediately drew back with an expression of pity and horror, and said not one word in my defence. My intention not to return to the office, but to start a new working life, was unshakable. It only remained to choose the kind of work, and there seemed to be no great difficulty about that, because I was strong, patient, and willing. I was prepared to face a monotonous, laborious life, of semi-starvation, filth, and rough surroundings, always overshadowed with the thought of finding a job and a living. And, who knows, returning from work in the great Gentry Street, I might often envy Dolikoff, the engineer who lives by intellectual work, but I was happy in thinking of my coming troubles. I used to dream of intellectual activity, and to imagine myself a teacher, a doctor, a writer but my dreams remained only dreams. A liking for intellectual pleasures, like the theatre and reading, grew into a passion with me, but I did not know whether I had any capacity for intellectual work. At school I had an unconquerable aversion for the Greek language, so that I had to leave when I was in the fourth class. Teachers were got to coach me up for the fifth class, and then I went into various departments, spending most of my time in perfect idleness, and this, I was told, was intellectual work. 
My activity in the education department or in the municipal office required neither mental effort, nor talent, nor personal ability, nor creative spiritual impulse. It was purely mechanical, and such intellectual work seemed to me lower than manual labor. I despise it, and I do not think that it for a moment justifies an idle, careless life, because it is nothing but a swindle, and only a kind of idleness. In all probability I have never known real intellectual work. It was evening. We lived in Great Gentry Street, the chief street in the town, and our rank and fashion walked up and down it in the evenings, as there were no public gardens. The street was very charming, and was almost as good as a garden, for it had two rows of poplar trees, which smelt very sweet, especially after rain, and acacias, and tall trees, and apple trees hung over the fences and hedges. May evenings, the scent of the lilac, the hum of the cockchaffers, the warm still air, how new and extraordinary it all is, though spring comes every year. I stood by the gate and looked at the passers-by. With most of them I had grown up and had played with them, but now my presence might upset them, because I was poorly dressed, in unfashionable clothes, and people made fun of my narrow trousers and large clumsy boots, and called them macaroni on steamboats. And I had a bad reputation in the town, because I had no position, and went to play billiards in low cafés, and had once been taken up, for no particular offence, by the political police. In the large house opposite, the Dolikoffs, the engineers, some one was playing the piano. It was beginning to get dark, and the stars were beginning to shine, and slowly, answering people's salutes, my father passed with my sister on his arm. He was wearing an old top hat with a broad curly brim. "'Look,' he said to my sister, pointing to the sky with the very umbrella with which he had just struck me, "'look at the sky. Even the smallest stars are worlds. How insignificant man is in comparison with the universe!' And he said this in a tone that seemed to convey that he found it extremely flattering and pleasant to be so insignificant. What an untalented man he was! Unfortunately, he was the only architect in the town, and during the last fifteen or twenty years I could not remember one decent house being built. When he had to design a house, as a rule, he would draw first the hall and the drawing-room. As in olden days schoolgirls could only begin to dance by the fireplace, so his artistic ideas could only evolve from the hall and the drawing-room. To them he would add the dining-room, nursery, study, connecting them with doors, so that in the end they were just so many passages, and each room had two or three doors too many. His houses were obscure, extremely confused, and limited. Every time, as though he felt something was missing, he had recourse to various additions, plastering them one on top of the other, and there would be various lobbies and passages and crooked staircases leading to the entresol, where it was only possible to stand in a stooping position, and where, instead of a floor, there would be a thin flight of stairs like a Russian bath, and the kitchen would always be under the house with a vaulted ceiling and a brick floor. The front of his houses always had a hard, stubborn expression, with stiff French lines, low squat roofs, and fat pudding-like chimneys, surmounted with black cowls and squeaking weathercocks, and somehow all the houses built by my father were like each other, and vaguely reminded me of a top hat and the stiff, obstinate back of his head. In the course of time the people of the town grew used to my father's lack of talent, which took root and became our style. My father introduced the style into my sister's life. To begin with, he gave her the name of Cleopatra, and he called me Miss Ale. When she was a little girl, he used to frighten her by telling her about the stars and our ancestors, and explained the nature of life and duty to her at great length. 
and now when she was twenty-six he went on in the same way allowing her to take no one's arm but his own and somehow imagining that sooner or later an ardent young man would turn up and wish to enter into marriage with her out of admiration for his qualities and she adored my father was afraid of him and believed in his extraordinary intellectual powers it got quite dark and the streets grew gradually empty in the house opposite the music stopped the gate was wide open and out into the street careering with all its bells jingling came a troika it was the engineer and his daughter going for a drive time to go to bed i had a room in the house but i lived in the courtyard in a hut under the same roof as the coach-house which had been built probably as a harness-room for there were big nails in the walls but now it was not used and my father for thirty years had kept his newspapers there which for some reason he had bound half yearly and then allowed no one to touch living there i was less in touch with my father and his guests and I used to think that if I did not live in a proper room and did not go to the house every day for meals, my father's reproach that I was living on him lost some of its sting. My sister was waiting for me. She had brought me supper unknown to my father, a small piece of cold veal and a slice of bread. In the family there were sayings, Money loves an account, or A kopeck saves a rouble and so on, and my sister, impressed by such wisdom, did her best to cut down expenses and made us feed rather meagerly. She put the plate on the table, sat on my bed, and began to cry. "'Miss Sale,' she said, "'what are you doing to us?' She did not cover her face, her tears ran down her cheeks and hands, and her expression was sorrowful. She fell on the pillow, gave way to her tears, trembling all over and sobbing. "'You have left your work again,' she said. "'How awful!' "'Do try to understand, sister,' I said, and because she cried I was filled with despair. As though it were deliberately arranged, the paraffin in my little lamp ran out, and the lamp smoked and guttered, and the old hooks in the wall looked terrible, and their shadows flickered. "'Spare us!' said my sister, rising up. "'Father is in an awful state, and I am ill. I shall go mad. What will become of you?' she asked, sobbing and holding out her hands to me. "'I ask you, I implore you, in the name of our dear mother, to go back to your work.' "'I cannot, Cleopatra,' I said, feeling that only a little more would make me give in. "'I cannot.' "'But why?' insisted my sister. "'Why? If you have not made it up with your chief, look for another place. For instance, why shouldn't you work on the railway? I have just spoken to Anuita Blagovo, and she assures me you would be taken on, and she even promised to do what she could for you. For goodness sake, Miss Sale, think, think it over, I implore you.' We talked a little longer, and I gave in. I said that the thought of working on the railway had never come into my head, and that I was ready to try. She smiled happily through her tears, and clasped my hand, and still she cried, because she could not stop, and I went into the kitchen for paraffin. End of Part 1